Hello everyone and welcome to Optimal Movement Methods first talk show. Our guest today is a very experienced physiotherapist, a pain coach and founder of BodyMap. Welcome Adele. Hi Shiv, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. So as we know our topic for today is chronic pain. So can you describe or define what is chronic pain? Uh, well, chronic pain is defined as literally pain that lasts more than three months. Okay. Um, beyond what we understand would be t the amount of time needed for tissues to heal. So if you were to fracture a bone, you know, it takes six to 12 weeks, about three months. If you have any tissue damage, the healing process completes in around three months. So if your pain persists after that, then typically it's known as uh, chronic pain. So what leads to chronic pain or what are the more common factors leading to chronic pain? Oh, well, before we can understand the factors that leads to chronic pain, we first need to understand what pain really is. Yeah. Um, so most people would link pain directly to how much tissues or injury has happened to your body, the yeah. physical injury. Yes. But what we know is that pain is not purely linked to tissue damage. As I said earlier, you can uh, totally heal from an injury and the pain can still persist. So the reason for that is the sensitivity of the nervous system it has changed. It picked up more signal earlier and faster, that, okay. so you perceive pain earlier. I see. Yeah, so once we understand then that pain is not purely linked to tissue damage, we can then understand that other factors outside of having hurt yourself in your, in your body can contribute to that pain. And we can talk about that, those factors looking at um, the iceberg model, okay. which will show up over here. So these are factors that are contributing to the ultimate pain experience. So over here we have the iceberg model, we are very familiar with this model for other things. What you can see is above the water level, which is in this case uh, the behavior of the person in pain, and then the overall pain experience. You can probably see a uh, facial expression and grimace or holding on to the area that hurts. So this is what is visible. Okay. The factors that are not visible, of course, are believe, below, uh, below the sea level. I see. Uh, in the iceberg itself, you have internal or intrinsic factors, which can contribute to the pain. And outside of the iceberg in the water, you have your external, extrinsic factors, which also contributes to the pain. Okay. So this is how we look at the person more holistically and not purely just a knee that's hurting, a shoulder that's hurting, or a back that's hurting. Okay. We look at other things that strongly contribute, and this is pain science, meaning it's not <clears throat> coming from me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's pain science with an understanding and knowledge that there are uh, internal factors, which I also use the word psychological factors, or I mental see. factors, emotional factors. Okay. And then external factors are more the environmental or contextual uh, factors that's happening around them. Okay. And all of these uh, are important factors which contributes to chronic pain. I see. Okay. So usually a person will see only this, what he's feeling and what the injury is. But these factors are ignored or yeah. not targeted. Yeah, as a person with pain, the person is not going to know or be aware that all these things are contributing. I see. Okay. Um, they might be able to tell you, oh, you know, yeah, I feel more pain when I have more work to complete. Okay. I have much more to do than usual. And that would fall under the work demands and the stress it creates as a result of that. I see. Uh, that is also a contributing factor to the whole pain experience. Okay, all right. So, like sometimes people will say the pain is only in the mind, right? We have very commonly heard this term. Like people always say, oh my, I think my pain is only in my mind. So is it true like you don't need to have a tissue damage to experience pain? Um, in pain science, that yes. is true. That means the research does show that you can have no tissue damage and be in a lot of pain. A good okay. example will be having uh, tension headaches, migraines, right. 
that has you can't find any injury or tissue damage, regardless of what scan you do. Yes. Uh, so that's a good example of hundred percent real pain. Okay. Okay, but hundred percent no tissue damage. Uh, so is there any particular group of people who are more vulnerable towards chronic pain? Um, yes, in terms of there are some research to show that um, people who have went through childhood trauma, so okay. they call it adverse childhood experiences or ACE, I see. that they do have a higher chance of being more vulnerable to chronic pain. Okay. Um, there are other research that links uh, pain to things like poor sleep, sleep disturbances, okay. um, as well as anxiety and depression that has links to pain. Okay. Um, so these factors or these, per these uh, things can uh, make them more vulnerable. I see, okay. Then there is also things like personality traits where more anecdotally you may notice uh, people with chronic pain are usually highly responsible people. I see. You know, they, they take on a lot or look after or caregivers for lots of people. Okay. Um, and they're usually um, more perfectionistic in their approach to life. Okay. Could be. So, so um, yeah, so probably these are more anecdotal things that uh, you will see okay. with, with patients. So how does pain coaching help people suffering from chronic pain? Okay, so pain coaching helps by looking at all these factors. Okay. So uh, we consider them as possible obstacles or barriers to getting better. Okay. Um, and it could be any of these factors, whether it's within the person or external to the person. Okay. And this approach then is, uh, we call it psychosocial approach. I mean, looking at it more holistically. All right. And seeing how that affects the physical uh, body of that person. Okay. Yeah. So how does pain coaching is different than counselling? Um, it's actually very different. With pain coaching, we see the person as a partner and possibly even an expert because we are working with them and a lot of the information we get from them. Okay. You know, like information about how they're coping with stress at work or sleep and other things that contributes to pain. All right. And with coaching, we look at what's happening now and what we need to do to move forward. So it's very goal-driven. Okay. Um, and we don't look backwards really much. So nice. with counselling, that probably is more about addressing uh, things that happened in the past uh, and what to do about them or, yeah, like past traumas and things that a coach, honestly speaking, we are not trained to do, yeah. Nice. So when a person, he or she needs to decide to go for pain coaching, like at what stage? Okay, so I, ideally, of course, pain coaching is well integrated into our typical physiotherapy approaches okay. so that they are getting it holistically as combined. But should a person went through a regular physical intervention like anywhere, maybe acupuncture, maybe chiropractor, maybe even having a surgery and physiotherapy okay. and still be in pain, then uh, obviously pain coaching would be the best uh, for them. Okay. Um, that means more focus on pain coaching and probably less on pure physical um, intervention or approach. I see. So okay. a person who's going for pain coaching, he should only be going for pain coaching or it's just like an adjunct to your regular treatment like physiotherapy or something else? Uh, okay, so um, again it depends on the person. If that person went through a lot of physical intervention and they still believe that it's a physical issue that needs to be fixed with anything, surgery or non-surgery, uh, physiotherapy, chiropractic, anything. But they have went down that route and it did not make a lasting change. Mm -hmm. Then I would say uh, pain coaching would be the majority of what they do. They might have to even drop the idea of 
needing a physical uh, fix-it solution. I see. Because that physical fix-it solution reinforce their belief, you know, their belief that this is something that needs to be fixed okay. physically. And I would say that percentage of people, well, they are there. There are people who have went through maybe years of treatment, uh, ranging from physiotherapy, chiropractor, or even surgery. And yes. a small percentage did not get lasting relief. Then yes, I would say a much more focus on pain coaching is needed. So you have any example of patients who have responded really well to pain coaching? Yeah, so I have one case that really, really stood out. He is a patient who had 40 years of back pain. Oh, so that long. when he was a youth. I see. And uh, he's still experiencing pain when I first met him. Uh, there's a lot of bad beliefs or faulty beliefs about his back. Um, so basically what happened was he believed his back is really weak, fragile, but because he still wants to play golf and badminton, he wears a corset and he goes out and oh. plays golf and badminton. <laughs> And over time, uh, it's the understanding that uh, it's actually his back is pretty strong. So he goes for uh, chiropractic adjustments, which sometimes helps. And so with pain coaching, it was more about, for him, it was more about addressing that belief. How is it that he's so afraid to move and do exercises himself, but when somebody create a lot of forces through his back, he could take it. I see. Yeah, so through through that, uh, we he understood that actually there was a lot of fear, uh, fear of movement, fear of uh, using his back. He can't trust himself to do certain things. And, and by overcoming that, he actually, yeah, he's actually much better now. He's, he's able to play golf and badminton without pain. I still check on him, I but see. I still, like, WhatsApp him and ask him and he's still good. He's oh, still good. he still reports to be pain free in his back. Oh, that's so amazing. of course it's uh to me that was remarkable. Yeah, that's really and amazing, yeah. It's really amazing because uh, uh it reinforced this idea that pain science do have something to offer. Uh yes. pain science can explain why pain persists past the time that your tissues <laughs> would have he finished healing. I see. Uh, it just persists and there are lots of other factors we could address. All right. Okay. Yeah. That was great. Now I have a few questions from uh, subscribers. Yeah. So the first question is from Stacy. She asks, how one can avoid going into a chronic pain stage? Okay. Um, this is a good question. It really, again, depends on the person. If this person is very active, very sporty and as they're doing their training and exercises, they're getting more and more pain and pain that lasts pretty long. Uh, it might mean that to avoid going to the chronic pain, they might then need to back off okay. and do less and then watch that their symptoms improve and then slowly build up again. I see. Uh, so for usually people who over overload physically, overdo, they can move into chronic pain. So that would be a good way to avoid. Okay. For people who move into chronic pain by doing less, so there will be those who hardly do anything and still having a lot of pain, uh, back pain or neck pain, it would actually be more the opposite. They might then have to move more, okay. uh, stretch more or do more movement for them to avoid going into chronic pain. All right. But that's putting it very simply <laughs> because there are, again, possibly many other factors that moves a person into chronic pain oh, I see. beyond just looking at moving or exercising too much or too little because okay. that's again just looking at the physical loading okay yeah all right okay so the next question is from andrew what are the common areas or conditions which end up into chronic pain the most common ones we'll see is usually around the spine, so okay. neck pain, back pain, you'll see. see those to be most common. Okay. Uh, but of course, it can also be at the arms and legs, like your knee pain can be very chronic as well. Okay. Even something like tennis elbow okay. or heel pain, you know, plantar fasciitis can I also see, see. be very likely move into being more chronic. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's actually many <laughs> conditions that that 
tends to move into being more chronic. But I would say the ones that are more debilitating yes. would be your back and neck uh, pain. Yeah. So the next three, four questions are quite generalized. Uh, they are asking basically how they can recover from low back pain. Okay. I know it's limited yeah. information because there's no, they, the black back pain can be for many reasons. Yeah, yeah. But what will be the general advice you will yeah, give so, them? Yeah, uh, so obviously, usually we want some that person to uh, check it out with a health professional, okay. a doctor, a physio. Yeah, so every patient with low back pain is different. So um, usually you want to clear anything serious. Um, that is causing the pain. Uh, so, getting someone to assess you and check on you is advisable. Um, but usually, if let's say you've been having uh, the pain for more than three months or years, then there could be an element that uh, you are afraid or fearful of hurting your back further. I see. So, we call that a uh, Catastrophization, so the person overthinks and worries about hurting their back and they tend to avoid a lot of exercises or do a lot less uh -huh. and yet experience the same amount or even more pain. I see. So I would say then usually what you can do the first is address that, address okay. that fear of hurting the back and understand that uh, movement is good for the back. So uh, motion is lotion. The more you can move freely and move your back, might include stretching, might include some exercises. It will get your back moving and make it feel better. Okay. So we can actually talk about that looking at the uh, next slide. So can to explain further what you can do with any with any pain. Well, in this case, uh, chronic back pain. Yes. Uh, that you want to start working on it or improve it. Okay. So this slide talks about uh, how pain will warn us ahead of tissue damage. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So on the left is uh, what happens before you have your back pain. So let's say an example is, let's say the back pain is from trekking or climbing a mountain. Okay. So before the injury, maybe you trek for five hours, then you start to have what we call the protect by pain line, meaning you haven't hurt anything. The back doesn't, it's not, I mean, your back is not injured. I see. But you have a protect by pain line, meaning uh, pain will come on to warn you. As in, can, it can be fatigue as well? Yeah, it can be fatigue, a general tightness or achiness. Okay. There is a warning sign. I see. Before you can hurt yourself. So okay. we all have warning signs, uh, I mean, uh, receptors in our body to warn us of potential injury. And you know, like you almost touch a hot stove, you withdraw. Yes. It feels like you hurt yourself, but you look at your finger, it's fine. Okay. So that is the protect by pain line. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so before injury is quite high, and then it's quite close to tissue tolerance. Tissue tolerance means uh, when you really hurt mm -hmm. the back. Well, in this case, the back. And this zone is very small. We call it the buffer zone. That means the distance between uh, these two is extremely small before you uh, injure yourself. Okay. Uh, after injuring yourself, what happens is your nervous system becomes sensitive to pain. So it tells you of pain before you can hurt yourself. I see. So what that means is the protect by pain line drops. Let's say in this example, you track two hours or less than two hours, you will feel the pain. And uh, it's, it will protect you a lot earlier. The buffer zone you can see has increased. Okay. So there's more there's way, way more protection before you can hurt yourself. I see. Okay. Yeah, and because of uh, actual having had the, actually having had the injury, obviously the tissue tolerance line, meaning actual amount of stress before you can hurt yourself, is also reduced. That I means you, there's higher chance of you hurting yourself uh, earlier, but, you, but literally you'll be, you'll be well aware of it way before you can hurt yourself. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so this is what happens when uh, pain lasts longer than three months or, or, or yeah, two years or decades of pain even. Okay. So am I right to say like after this line when you started feeling that discomfort, that's when a person can compensate more and end up having more issues to other areas of the body? Yeah, it could be. It, it could be that uh, if they are not uh, positively addressing that initial issue, you sometimes do see uh, back pain 
becoming some knee pain or you know or vice versa I see. because they change how they move or they overly adapt uh -huh. to or overly compensate yes. uh, for the initial problem okay all right yeah so what that leads to then is <laughs> then what do you do yes uh, basically what you want to understand is that movement is good movement will help move these two up okay uh, if you go to the next slide uh, you understand that movement is good, motion is lotion. It reduces the sensitivity of your nervous system. So you'll find you can do more if you slowly do more. And I think it's quite common sense. Yes. A person realizes that if they slowly do more, they, they can actually slow, uh, do more and more over time. Uh, that is the understanding that motion is lotion. And, and, and also the understanding that it's a, it has healed, right? So the, the nervous system is sensitive. Yeah. That means if you feel pain, doesn't mean it's harmful. True. So, so the second thing is understand that hurt is not always equal to harm. Okay. And that's very true for chronic pain. Hurt is not always equal to harm. Yes. Okay, so feeling a bit of soreness and pain exercises is, is going to help you actually slowly do more. And oh. over time, as you do more, you will raise this too. Protect by pain line and the tissue tolerance line. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, and how, how you do that is ideally integrate pain coaching and physio. Uh, get to know your mind and body together, retrain both. I that see. is ideal. Okay. Uh, and what we don't want to do is to fight it, like, or oh, ignore the pain and push through exercises. We don't want that because that can also make things worse. Uh, that can uh, bring down this protect by pain line because the more you keep re, 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 uh, uh, the more you keep in making your pain return with more exercises and it's not coping, the, 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 the line may also drop. I see. Yeah. And uh, what you also don't want to do is to do a lot less because doing a lot less, the line can also drop. Your tolerance for, uh, for protect by pain and all this will also drop. Uh, okay. okay, so thank you Adil. That was really informative. Hope to have you back on the show again. Thank you, Shiv. Thanks for having me here. So, do share this information with your family and friends, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button to receive all notifications for future videos. Stay fit, keep going, love life.